In this introduction to quantum computing hardware, we're going to cover what a quantum computer is, what is a qubit, what are the advantages of quantum computers and, and the real-world applications, the different approaches to building quantum computing hardware, and how this plays together with software. And most importantly, Emma? Before we dive in, bear in mind, if you're not getting it, you're getting it. So the quantum technology space is certainly a very interesting one that's seen quite a lot of development recently. But if you're anything like me, it's almost impossible to decipher what's actually happening there. Which is why I'm really happy to be doing this session today with Emma from our investment team uh, to explain a little bit more in detail what actually is happening in the quantum computing space. So Emma, why don't you quickly, quickly introduce yourself? Yes, um, so my name is Emma. I'm an investment associate here at Verf and I have a background in theoretical physics from ETH. Um, and, and that's why I'm mainly focused on our quantum portfolio at Verf. Great. So Emma, could you maybe give us a little rundown of the current state of quantum computing? Yeah, you said it before, the quantum computing space is really on the rise. And we also see that, for example, in the investment volume. This year, so 2021, investors invested almost 3 billion into the quantum technology space. And just to put that into perspective, about five, six years ago, that was only like 90 million per year. And furthermore, this 3 billion actually comes back in another area because 3.1 billion is now the value of Psi Quantum, the highest valued uh, quantum company. And lastly, just to um, make sure you understand that this is not even such a big space yet, because there are only 98 uh, institutions and organizations working on um, quantum computing technology as of today. Well, so it's really already in terms of volume pretty big, but in terms of number of people working on it, still still quite small. Could you maybe explain what exactly quantum computers are? I think that would be a good sort of starting point for this conversation. Absolutely. So quantum computers, we may all have heard about it. And yes, it is a computer, but the first thing that we have to realize is it's not just a better computer. Uh, people, for example, like to say it's like, a light bulb is also not just a better candle, it's really a different underlying system. And that's mainly because these quantum computers, they leverage the properties of, of very small particles and how those interact. And the science behind that is called quantum mechanics, which is also why we call them quantum computers. And if you want to understand how they work, we actually need to go back to kind of the building blocks of quantum computers. Um, and these are called quantum bits. Actually, the equivalent of, of classical bits which you know from any any computer system out there today and yeah quantum bits is a bit long so nowadays we all call them just qubits actually and what is it about uh, computers built in this fashion that makes them more powerful than than standard computers yeah so as i already said this is a very different system right it's really based on physical principles instead of digital ones there are actually three characteristics of qubits or of quantum systems that make them very interesting and to explore for computing and therefore also very powerful. So the first one um, is called superposition. You may have heard of it, um, but for that we, we quickly go back to classical bits. So you might know that classical bits are always either in the one state or in the zero state. It's just simply a current flowing or a current not flowing. The interesting thing about qubits, however, is that they're actually one and zero at the same time. And even more than that, they're actually also everything in between. Which sounds a bit weird maybe, but it's easier if you translate it to a physical particle. So you can, each particle, for example, an electron has kind of a spin. So the spin can be up or down, but you can already imagine that it can also be everything in between. And actually, it is everything in between until you observe it or until you measure it, because this, that's the second property. So measurement changes the state. So that means as soon as you look at that quantum state, it will tell you I'm either one or I'm zero. And these two properties is also what comes back in uh, Schrodinger's famous thought experiments about the, about the cat. So he basically says, if you take a cat and you put it into a box and you completely isolate it, then it might as well be alive or dead or anything in between, you don't know. But as soon as you go and look and you open the box, the cat will certainly be alive or dead, right? So that's actually superposition, which is then again broken by measurement. And that's already quite powerful, but there's actually a third element to it, and that's entanglement. And entanglement basically means that if you take two particles, they are fully connected. And connected in the sense that how it doesn't matter how far you take them apart, they will still have kind of a secret connection. This is what Einstein called spooky action at the distance. 
Um, so that measure that means sorry that means if you measure one qubit and you find it in the one state, you are hundred percent sure that the other entangled qubit will be in the zero state. All quite mind baffling, <laughs> but I know when we were talking about about the session, another thing you said is that no matter how much you try to understand this, you still need to accept a certain element of mystery. So I, thank you very much for already breaking <laughs> it down like this, but. I think there's parts of it which are so complex that we just need to accept. But so you mentioned all these three elements which which make them powerful. How does that actually play out? Yeah, so it's it's best to kind of look at an example, and it's it's easiest if we compare classical bits to qubits, for example. Um, so if we would take two classical bits, we can actually make four combinations. They can be both one, one can be one, one can be zero, etc. Now, because of superposition, we would actually only need one qubit to describe all those four states. So that means one qubit is two classical bits. But it actually gets much more powerful, it scales quite quickly. Because if you take two qubits, you would already need four classical bits to describe all the states. That actually goes on. So let's say we take 10 qubits, we need two to the power of 10 classical bits to describe that, which is more than a thousand classical bits. So in that case, it, it scales exponentially, which makes these computers quite powerful. And what are what are the sort of, because I think understanding this, okay, we got it, it's still quite theoretical, but what are the, the used cases for which quantum computing can and will be used in the future and yeah. presently already? Yeah, absolutely. So th there are many of them because you, you can imagine that these computers can become quite powerful. We also have to realize they do not they cannot do everything better than classical computers, but there are a couple types of problems where they are very suitable. So one of the things is, for example, optimization. Because you can imagine if you, for example, have 10 cities which you want to connect in the most efficient way, what a classical computer needs to do is just try out each way and in the end look at what the shortest path was. Now remember this superposition thing that we were talking about. So a quantum computer can actually explore all those paths at the same time, which makes it exponentially faster than a classical one. And that's not only for such a traveling problem, but it's just finding the best solutions from all possible solutions out there, which quantum computer can do very well. And other examples are, for example, chemistry simulations, which you could use to uh, study mole molecules and therefore find new drugs, for example. Um, and lastly, also because it's a powerful system that can deal with a lot of variables involved, it's also quite suitable for machine learning, for example. Okay, gotcha. And I mean, we're talking about a nascent industry. It's only starting, so there's no there's no standard yet. There's and you mentioned to me there's there's different approaches. Why don't you run us through the different uh, quantum computing hardware approaches that are currently being um, explored in more detail? Yes, because you said it right. We we don't have a winning qubit yet because this qubit sounds like just one sort of thing that we can make, but that's actually not true. They can be made out of very different materials and also built up in different ways. So the easiest way to split it, and this is still quite high level, is we divide the landscape by type of particle that is used to make the qubits. So then we see three mainstream approaches. So first of all, we have the electrons. These are these small charged particles. You could almost view it as a single unit of electricity. So there is a charge to it. And the second are atoms. They are a bit bigger. So that's, that's kind of the building blocks of all our materials, right? The smallest neutral unit that there is. And lastly, you can also explore the properties of light, which is a very typical quantum thing to do. This, I don't know, some of you might remember the wave-particle duality. So the fact that light can be both a particle, which we call a photon, but also be described by a wave function. So very typical quantum thing, and that's also why people look into it. All right, gotcha. So we now understand which particles are used to actually make qubits, mm -hmm. but a qubit alone or a group of qubits are not yet a computer. Indeed. I mean, you need a little bit more for that, right? So uh, there's actually a, a scientist called Di Vincenzo, and he, he set up a set of requirements which every quantum computing system should fulfill to be yeah, feasible, so to say. So if we just quickly walk through those, then you might get an idea also of the complexity of, of building these kind of computers. So the, the first one is a scalable physical system with well-characterized qubits. We now know what qubits are. 
we just need uh, the right building blocks. But scalable is important because that also means in terms of material, but also the infrastructure. You might have seen those huge chandeliers. That's actually all cooling system. So we might need to do something about the scalability there. But good, going back to the criteria. So the second one is actually the ability to initialize the state of the qubit in a simple fiducial state. Sounds very complicated. It basically means that you need to be able to create a neutral starting position. Because quantum is very easily disturbed and you don't want the operations that you do to pretend to depend on the starting positions that you had. Um, the third one is long relevant coherence time, which basically means you need a time that is long enough to do your computations before the system goes into an error state. So before kind of the qubits are disturbed. The fourth one is a universal set of quantum gates. Well, quantum gates are actually the operations that you can do, which is the equivalent of, of just classical gates. So it means you have a universal set of operations and out of that you can make algorithms and actually operate a quantum computer. And then the last one is a qubit specific measurement capability. We spoke about the fact that measurement is not just a passive thing, it actually has an influence on the system. So we need to have a very well-defined way of measuring the qubit so that it actually gives us the answer that we want in the end. All right, so by understanding now these requirements a little bit better, could we dive again into the three different approaches and see what the advantages are of each and, and the challenges? Yes, yeah, so keep these in mind and then we can just look at, at some examples from, from each category basically. So we start with the electrons and actually the, the best example there are superconducting circuits. Why is it, is it the best example? It's mainly what most people are working on. So the Googles, uh, Amazon, IBMs of this world are all working on these superconducting circuits. And what is important to keep in mind is actually we're not talking about single particles here, but it's way closer to uh, classical electricity flows. Um, so the advantages are also that it's actually closest to classical computers, which means that we can leverage a lot of the classical infrastructure to make our chips, for example. Um, and this is also why it's one of the most advanced fields currently. Also pushed by the big number of large players and the big number of players uh, that are working on it. That's also why actually the, the IBM machine that holds now the record of most qubits released, um, that's also a superconducting machine. However, it, it's not a perfect approach, of course. So there are some clear challenges that are becoming clearer and clearer, actually. So these systems are relatively sensitive to errors, so they're easily disturbed, which, for example, means that we have to put them at very low temperature so that almost nothing moves. Um, what is also difficult is that the individual qubits differ quite a lot. So they're not homogeneous which means that they are more complex to control. And lastly, um, you can only connect nearest neighbors. So that means I can only be connected to you and to my next neighbor, but not to all the other qubits. So that means you need quite a lot of them to do more complex computations. Gotcha. All right, and what about the, the atoms approach? Yeah, so actually the front runner there are ion trap qubits. So ions are also charged particles because you take an atom and you actually remove one electron. And because they are charged, you can actually use electrical fields or magnetic fields to move around these physical particles. It's quite a beautiful approach scientifically. That's also what, for example, IonQ thought, which is one of the companies that went public this year. Um, so the advantage of this approach are that you have very uniform and also very stable qubits. So you have relatively uh, low complexity in controlling them. And also, each qubit can be to connected to any other in the system. So we just spoke about the nearest neighbor connection, mm -hmm. so me only being connected to my direct neighbors. But because you can physically move around these qubits, you can actually just take them to the group that you want to connect them to. So that means you can do faster computation because you have many more connections. Um, and the last thing is that, uh, remember entanglement? Well, this is very easy to do with ions because you can use photons to do it. But of course, again, not a perfect approach, right? There are quite some challenges here as well. And the first one is actually the most prominent one, and that's the scalability. We don't yet know how to scale these systems beyond, let's say, 50 qubits, where we already think that to have really practical quantum computers, we might need millions of qubits in the future. So that, that's a clear challenge. 
Um, and they also, like the superconducting qubits, have relatively high infrastructure requirements. So they okay. need to be cold and they also need to be um, in vacuum. So that, those are the most important ones. And, and the last approach that you explained? Yes, yeah, so we also spoke about light, right? This is something completely different. So it, it's a very different particle because a photon, so a single light particle, doesn't have mass. So it, it has no weight. So is it actually a particle? Well, that's, that's a whole different Probably not a debate discussion. you should be having with me. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But what, what's interesting is that photonics itself, so the science behind light, is actually used across all approaches because light is generally used to control the different qubits. Yeah. And that's also why we have a lot of components that already uh, know how to process these photons, for example. So you can leverage, again, a lot of the existing infrastructure. And we heard from the other two that they had very high infrastructure requirements. Well, actually, that's not the case here, because these photonic processors could just function at room temperature, like classical computers, for example. That sounds like a very big advantage. That is a very big advantage. Now, there are some side notes to that, because not every component in that supply chain works at room temperature, but it's one of the big promises that, that photonic quantum computers have. However, again, there are some challenges and, and one of the things is that photons, if you want to produce them, that's a probabilistic process. So that means you cannot produce them on demand, at least not the right photons. So to deal with that, what you usually do is you build in a lot of redundancy. So you just do things a hundred times so that one time you have actually the right computation. Well, you are already hear that that's not necessarily very scalable because for every operation you need not to add one qubit, but actually 100 copies of that qubit. Oh, wow. So that's a challenge uh, to be solved. And with that actually also comes that these photons, they don't have weight, right? So they're very difficult to trap and store and slow down. They kind of go very fast through the system without you being able to control them very well which also means it's, it's harder to do a large number of operations in a row on them. So it sounds like you know, three approaches that have, have great advantages, but also some challenges. Um, if we'd summarize sort of the state of uh, quantum computing hardware, what would you say are the, the most important takeaways? Yeah, so w w where we started, right? Quantum computers are not just better classical computers. It's really a different physical system. And that comes with a lot of the ch challenges that we have, have just discussed. And we have discussed the different approaches and we see that there are different ones and they all have their challenges but also advantages. Which also means that one computer is better suited for one application, so let's say optimization problems, where another is better at solving chemical simulations. So it's important to keep in mind that especially in the coming years, there will be different approaches that actually coexist and they will also coexist with classical computers because we need a combination of all. So there is no clear winner, even all these approaches might be the winner in the end. So, but we're talking now about hardware. Obviously, just like a computer cannot run only on hardware, maybe as a concluding note, could you say something about um, quantum software as well? Yeah, it's a very good point, right? Because th these hardware machines, we can build qubits, we can connect them and they can do some kind of operations, but that doesn't give us anything yet. It doesn't solve a problem. So for that, we actually need, also need software. And because these approaches are also physically different, we, different kind of machines also require different kinds of software. And there are all kinds of layers of software. So what you see now is that a lot of these hardware players also have to become specialists on the software side because the software is so specific to their qubits. Um, but of course, if we go kind of higher in the value chain and we talk about algorithms, there are a lot of companies that already think about how can we actually leverage these special quantum properties to solve the big problems. And that, that's a whole industry on its own, right? So we can definitely talk about that maybe another day. But we have to keep in mind the hardware is not where it stops, it's a whole ecosystem, right? Both on the software side and also on the infrastructure side. Well, it certainly sounds like exciting time uh, to, to be looking at the space. And Emma, thank you again for taking the time for dumbing this down for us. <laughs> I certainly feel like I have a better understanding of what quantum computing is. Um, and again, thanks so much.